teams of data science and feedback. Um, this talk is about automating the full data science pipeline, and I know that you already saw some of what we do at FIDA in this talk. But I think it's important for me to explain why do we actually need this automation? Because most companies, this is something that they don't actually need. Um, most companies might have one or two data sets, one or two models in production, so automating the full pipeline is not a necessity for them, but it is for us. Um, so, let me tell you why we use data, uh, where we use data science at FeedZio and what we actually use. So, in January 2017, Professor Andrew from Stanford, the founder of Google Brain, the founder of Coursera, he said that in a talk like this, actually in January 2017, uh, the only okay, in the slide I didn't change there. It's magic. So now the magic is undone. Um, so Professor Andrews said that the only industry that will not be transformed by AI is probably hairdressing. And this was in January 2017. Um, he was wrong. So in September that year, Modiface, a startup, they created an uh, augmented reality tool that would allow you to select the color of your hair in real time. And you could rotate your face. Um, it would consider the shades and the reflection of your hair, and you could try uh, different colors or different styles. Uh, L'Oreal is also trying something similar with makeup. So even something as simple as their dressing is being revolutionized. Another quote I particularly like is this one from Dick Bostrom, professor at Oxford, that he usually said that when something becomes useful enough and common enough, it's no longer AI. And nowadays we don't think of a chess playing engine or sales forecasting as artificial intelligence. But it is something that was strictly in the realm of artificial intelligence not that many years ago. So artificial intelligence is like a god of the gaps. As our technology progresses, AI is getting smaller and smaller. So what we do at FitTime is basically AI for banking. We try to bring all these technologies to multiple banks, multiple acquirers, and merchants online. And we do this specifically in order to protect commerce. Th that's our major goal, it's detecting fraud. And we offer four different uh, solutions. We do transaction fraud monitoring. We try to identify money launders. We also target account opening um, touch points with customers so that we prevent what attacks from opening fake bank accounts. Um, and also merchant monitoring. This is needed because it's a lot easier to be vi a victim of fraud than you might think. For instance, I imagine that some of you might have seen this before. I hope not all of you. I hope not some of you. Because if you are thinking that this is an ATM, then you are wrong. Okay? An ATM is that thing on the right. On the left, you have an ATM that was adapted by a schemer to steal credit card details. So on the top left, you can see a webcam to record you entering your PIN. You can also see a credit card overlay in the location where your credit card is inserted to copy the magnetic band. And most of these devices also have a fake PIN pad so that it can record the PIN that you're entering. And because things like this actually exist, uh, and they exist in Portugal, um, 
fraud detection is something that every bank needs. It's, it's just too easy to, to buy credit cards online and to steal credit, card, credit cards. Just two weeks ago, a guy in Lisbon was charged with five years in prison because he had uh, 6,000 credit cards stolen that he was using in Lisbon. So it's not something remote. Also, I have a video here that you can see how it actually happened in other locations. Like it was in Miami, in a convenience store. You have two people, one of them is distracting the cashier, while the second one is just going to place an overlay on the point of sale. So that everyone that uses this convenience store in the future is going to get uh, his credit card stolen. Okay, I can play it again. So you can see that the first guy is distracting the cashier, asking for something at the other end of the store, while in less than three seconds, it's done. So, and, and it's really, really hard to tell if a machine that you're seeing for the first time has been tampered with or not. Okay, so it's practically impossible for a normal person to be aware to see if there are those signs or not. So, global card fraud is expected to exceed $35 billion by 2020. Uh, the same report is estimating $45 billion by 2025. What we know is that just two years ago it was just at $22 billion and increasing. Uh, because as more commerce is moving online, it's easier and easier to, to commit fraud. So, the only way for us to stay ahead of the bad guys is really to research and disrupt. If you are trying to write uh, an engine to play chess, or if you are trying to detect cancer, you are not fighting against an opponent. You, are, you have a problem that you are trying to solve using machine learning. It's detecting cancer, but the cancer is not fighting back. In fraud detection, there is an opponent who is making less money as you are detecting the problem transactions. So it's really a cat and mouse game. You are really invested in understanding how they are evolving, and you need to be faster. You need to be faster than they are. You cannot be six months or one year, you cannot wait that long to put a new model in production. You need to be much more efficient and much quicker. So there is obviously a strong need for automation. There is no way around it. This is a reality, and in FIDA in particular, and if you saw the previous talk from Luis, we have multiple clients, we have multiple environments. If we have 50 clients, you cannot afford to have teams or, of two or three data scientists spending three months, six months to develop a new machine learning model for that client. It's not a scalable process. You cannot, you cannot have three people three months times 50 or times 100. It simply doesn't scale. So we need to automate this full machine learning process so that we are more effective in fighting fraud. And there are several solutions out there. Um, these are just some examples. Um, Auto AutoSkillearn is probably the, the oldest. Google launched the Google AutoML Vision. So it's literally a platform for you to, to train your own <coughs> machine learning models for computer vision. But they have many others, uh, for NLP for instance. Um, H2O, if you come from data science and machine learning, they have a very strong offering on um, machine learning algorithms in their Java APIs. They also have an AutoML solution, and the others um, are pretty much similar. DataRobot is an interesting story. Uh, this startup, they got $100 million in funding before they actually released the, their product, so it was a big risk. Uh, I, I, I can't recall anything similar, but the product actually worked when they released, so it, it was a, something that actually paid off. Uh, but what these tools have in common is that they focus on model selection and, and hyperparameter tuning. So they focus on trying to get the best model from the data that they are given and trying multiple hyperparameters to get the best results. But the data science workflow, the typical pipeline that we use is much bigger than that. So it usually starts with uh, getting data, preparing data, it's like this data wrangling that some people say takes 90% of the time. It's literally like a fight in the mud against databases and data. Um, then feature engineering, selecting which features work, which selection, and then finally you get to your model selection phase when you are ready to build a model. 
And then most people don't even think about that, but model monitoring is also a big issue. After you have your model in production, how do you know it's performing well? Um, especially if you are deploying a model for a third party like a client, how can they trust that your model is doing what you say it's doing? Um, and I'm not even talking about things like, is our model fair, is it transparent, um, is our model racist? I'm not talking about things like that. I'm talking about simpler things like, is, your, is the performance of your model decaying? Which is much simpler than the previous questions. Um, today I'm going to focus on this part. Now that I think that data preparation isn't important, I think it is. I think it's just too difficult to automate properly. So I'll talk about five different projects in these four areas that we, are, that, that we have at PISA right now. And all together, they allow us to go from several weeks into just one or two days. Um, the first of those pro uh, projects is Semantic Aware Automatic Feature Engineering. So feature engineering, let me remind you, it's that step where you take your raw data, your data set, and you try to find new columns, new features that separate the noise from the signal better. So in the case of fraud detection, you are trying to come up with new ideas that allow your machine learning model to say which transactions are fraud and which are not. Um, previous tools for automatic feature engineering they, were, they aren't that common, you cannot find uh, a lot of stuff online, but they typically, those that exist, define a set of operators that are applied to primitive data types. So, if you have multiple numbers in your data set, these tools will try to sum them, or try to see which one is bigger, and create new features based on that. But this creates many, many nonsensical features, features that just don't make sense. I mean, would you ever sum the price and the time since the previous event, or summing two IDs, or trying to find the string similarity between the customer name and the product that they are buying, or the type of the product? Mm -hmm. These are things that these tools for automatic feature engineering will try to create, because that's all they know, right? They are just looking at data types and combining things more or less randomly. Um, this was our insight. So imagine that you don't actually know what are the best features, and you don't know because it's the first time that you are looking at this data set, but you have some intuition on how they should look like. You have your experience of, we have been doing this for 20, 30 different clients, so when a new client approaches us with their data, we are not going to be summing price and the time since the previous event. Right? We, we know more or less what worked before, we don't know if it's going to work now, but at least we have a look at this. So what we created was a procedure, a process, that would allow us to produce less features, but they would be more relevant, and we do it through the user transformations that have our domain knowledge. In Fidzai's case, it's the fraud detection knowledge that we have. And it's composed of three building blocks. So we use tags to attach semantic information to fields, so that we're not doing this blindly anymore. We define transformations that are going to build new features based on the features that exist. And we also have time, because time is a very important component in fraud detection, so that you can perform aggregations. And you can know things like, what's the average amount that this credit card typically uses over the past day? Or what's the average amount? Uh, how many transactions did he use? Uh, did he do at midnight? over the past month, things like that. Um, and this is very extensible and flexible because you can just add new transformations and data scientists really like it because it's replicating their workflow. That's also how they think because usually they think about price and not about whether the amount is in dollars or in euros. They just think more abstractly in these generic concepts. And it's also generic because it's not really related to fraud, right? Everyone that needs to do feature engineering very often can apply this in every company. So tags, they attach semantic meaning. So imagine that to start with these two fields, which is a user email address and a payment card ID. You could attach multiple tags to these fields. For instance, the first one is an email. It's also the user input, so it's something that the user might have entered on the website. That's relevant because fraudsters sometimes just smash their fingers on the keyboard and the, and the distance between letters tends to be smaller than 
uh, normal users, for instance. Um, and it's also an entity. We, we can see how we can use that information later. And for instance, the payment card ID, just a card, an entity. We then define transformations. And this is basically creating new knowledge. So if you have two fields that are coordinates, you also have a distance. Right? So if uh, your client is Uber and you have the pickup location and the drop-off location, you can calculate the distance. If you are an online store, you have coordinates based on the IP address of this user and you have a shipping location, you can see if the guy is from Myanmar trying to ship something to the US. It might, might be fraud. Um, you can create other, other things like time since. The average amount is actually an interesting example using the entity. You probably want to calculate many aggregations over different fields. For instance, you want to know what's the average amount that this email typically the, um, uses in transactions, what the average amount of, that this card typically uses in transactions, and so forth. And then you can go further. You can actually start combining these derived features to create yet new features, like after you calculate the average automatically and the standard deviation, you can calculate what's the probability of an amount appearing. So you can actually iterate, and these transformations can apply to other uh, features that didn't exist initially. And finally, you actually specify windows because all these aggregations, they can just multiply and create new, new features based on that, new transformations based on that. Okay, so for instance, you maybe you want to create these aggregations over the past hour, past day, or past week. And that's everything that you need. So just a quick example, imagine that your data set starts with four features, with these tags, you can just apply the transformations that exist, and you get new features that you add to your data set, and then you can iterate. And we tested this process in many different data sets. Uh, this is just the results on one uh, of UK's biggest banks. We used 22 million records to train our models and 40 million records to test them. Just using 29 transformations that we see that typically work in clients, we produce 320 new features. But what is interesting here is the results that we get. So uh, in the plot you have on the y-axis the recall, and that's basically the detection rate. The bigger the better. While on the x-axis you have how many legitimate transactions you are blocking and you shouldn't, so the lower the better. And the red curve is what you get if you just use the raw features that the bank uh, gives you. The green curve at the top is what our team of data scientists after multiple weeks arrived at, and this was the result that they delivered to the client. But the blue line, which is very close to the green line, not yet above, it's what we could automatically generate. Okay, so these 320 new features pretty much bridge most of the gap. And what's most important is that you can do this in just one day, just specifying some tags on the fields, uh, specifying the semantic information, while creating 300 features by hand actually takes several weeks, even for a team of experienced data scientists that has done this before. So this is the benefit that you get, and it's very relevant. Um, next thing I'd like to talk about is feature selection. So feature selection is when you get all the features in your data set and try to identify which are important and which aren't. And after something is automatic feature engineering, you can see that you might have many redundant features, many things that you don't actually care about that you should be removing. Uh, although feature selection is in general a good, a good practice because it allows you to reduce overfitting, there are some engineering benefits as well that are not as evident. For instance, you are going to train faster, you are going to be using less memory in production, uh, your models are going to be simpler, so it's just an overall a good thing to try. Um, and we evaluated seven different feature selection methods. Um, they are pretty much uh, well known, the mean decrease in recall, uh, the feature importance of gradient boosted trees, and also multiple information theory filters like joint mutual information, um, things like that. And then we tried multiple sampling strategies, changing the class imbalance, uh, what's the percentage of fraud in your data, and things like that. And we tried to see which of these techniques actually finds the most fraud using the less data as possible. How, how, how good they are, are they at 
selecting the most important features. Um, so these are the results. What you have is on the left, the, the outcome when you are training a logistic regression. It's basically one type of model. And on the right, you have a different type of model, random parse classifier. What we are interested in is, is finding what's the method that gets you to the top as quickly as possible. And that's clearly uh, GBT. So if you are, what we found out today is that if you actually want to do feature selection, using the feature importance from grand, uh, gradient boosted trees is really good, because it's also a very fast method, and it gets you the best results as quickly as possible. For instance, on the plot on the right, if you are training a random forest, using 50 features gives you better results than using 250 features. Um, so this is really important. And there's another piece of the puzzle. After you do automatic feature engineering, you should do automatic feature selection so that you are back at a reasonable number of features. Um, and finally, automatic model selection. So this is a process that is much better known. So choosing a machine learning algorithm always requires choosing hyperparameters. And that's something that you, you need to optimize. And there are two main techniques in the literature. Either you do grid search or you do random search. So in grid search, you basically start with your parameter space and you define some interval you are going to try it's a random forest, they're going to try 100, 100, 300, 400, 500 trees, and you see what gives the best results. Or you just search randomly. You just start flipping coins, you get random numbers for your parameters, and you try as many models as possible. And random search works really, really well in practice. It's, uh, it works much better than it should, actually. It's, it's really not, not trivial to understand why it works as well. Uh, <laughs> Actually, if you compare it with some frequently used Bayesian optimization methods, it actually cannot perform them. And in the examples we run, it actually outperformed them very frequently. However, it's not as good as using hyperband. And hyperband is a, an interesting technique. And here we are measuring how much time you have in hours to train your model, or how many models are you willing to train while on the y-axis you are measuring the performance of your best model. What hyperband does is it does a sort of random search, but in uh, smaller data sets, like uh, in this very small number of transactions, and if the model seems to be good, it will later train that model on a bigger data set using more transactions. So it's able to prune much faster, and that's why you also see many blue points in the, in the curve, and then you have a stretch um, without points, and that's where it's training a bigger model with more data. And hyperband also works really well. Um, okay, so finally, getting to the less common stuff. Um, model monitoring. Imagine the following, the following scenario. You have a model in production, and you have three people related to your system. Okay? You have a fraudster, you have Adriana Grand, and you have the IT guy. And they are all doing 20,000 transactions. But the reason is actually different, right? So the, the fraudster is just a bot attack. Okay. While well, Adriana Grand is related to transactions, but it's more different people buying concerts for, uh, uh, buying tickets for a concert, and everything sold out in 30 seconds. So it was a burst in your system in 30 seconds, but everything sold out very quickly. While the IT guy, well, he just made a mistake. <laughs> it's, uh, it's much more common than you might think. Uh, he just, just made a mistake. So it's, it's really a three-part problem, because we want to detect when this is happening, because we want to alert uh, the fraud analysts and data scientists and tell them, look, there is something you should look into. Uh, but it's not easy, because there are many types of scenarios, many things that can happen that you'd like to alert. Um, and can you do it in real time? I mean, if you are receiving 2,000 transactions per second, um, monitoring is only useful if you can do it then, not next day or one week after. And can you do it without knowing if transactions are legitimate or not? Because you don't have labels. They are, they are just arriving. They are just coming in. And our three-part problem also has a three-part solution. So we created what we call the 
model scores or the, the drift score and we do it using the Jensen channel divergence and this is basically if you if you imagine that you have the scores of your model in the past hour and if you have the scores of your model in the past day or over the three previous days more or less in the same period so if it's now around noon maybe you also have the scores of the around noon of the three previous days you can actually measure how different are the, the two distributions. And they shouldn't be that different if everything are, is going okay. And if you have enough data, the two distributions should be more or less similar. Probably have similar amount of fraud, probably have a similar amount of legitimate customers. So if anything changes by a lot, or if there is a, a band of scores that your model is giving that is now much higher than before, then that's probably a reason to, to dig deeper. Then, and this is a very interesting technique, you can actually learn automatically what's the difference between now and the past. And we do that by training a model that learns to distinguish transactions from the present and transactions that happened yesterday. And it should be very difficult to distinguish if a transaction was, uh, was done today or yesterday, but and transactions that are really easy to distinguish then they probably belong to both attack. They have something in common that allows the model to identify them very well. And so we can not only tell the data scientist, look, you should look at the data right now. We can also tell them, these are the transactions that are really suspicious because they are very easy to distinguish from the previous day. But not only that, we can look at the feature importance of the model and tell the data scientist, it's the IP address that is really strange, but all these transactions have the same IP address. So we can tell the data scientist specifically where to look at. And we try this in many different data sets. Um, this is more or less how, how it would work. So you have your target window, your reference window that is bigger than the, tar tar than the target window. You mo monitor the difference between the distribution of your scores. And if it goes too high, you basically generate a report saying these transactions are suspicious and should look into it. We tried this on both banks and online merchants, and we found many interesting things. We found bot attacks that the client didn't know what happened, and they had already sent them to goods. Uh, we even found missing data issues. We had a client that decided to change the, the registration screen on their application without telling us. So we had transactions from new users coming to our system without some fields, while transactions from old users had those fields. And that was completely confusing our model because it was expecting that those fields missing, they were very related to fraud in the past, and now they were no longer related to fraud. And that's simply because the client can change stuff without you knowing. And this was, this was the way for us to detect that. And even unexpected peaks that, well, they just happened. It's the Ariana Grand example. If there is a concert, there is a peak in activity, and you are going to affect it, but it's not necessarily a problem. Finally, um, every fraud detection system also has a component of rules. So if you go outside for lunch in 15 minutes, and if you buy something with your credit card, and if one hour later your credit card is also used in a physical location in Cambodia, I'm quite sure that every bank is going to block the second transaction. Because it's very easy to measure the velocity to go from a point of sale here in Porto to a point of sale in Cambodia. And that's something that they want to block 100% of the time. So they have rules in place to do it. Um, the problem is, well, what is wrong with this, with this approach? It's basically that every rule that you add, it's a burden. You need to run with it forever. Because you are, if a fraud analyst decides that that rule is good, it's really difficult to convince him that the rule is now bad. Although fraudsters are now using a different pattern because they are being blocked by you. So, as they are using a different pattern, the only transactions that you are blocking are now from legitimate customers. So it's really important to have a system that can monitor the performance of your rules 
and suggest which rules should be removed and which rules we should create. So this is something that we are now um, actively researching at FITZAI. And we use different data sets, but in one example, we analyzed one of our clients who had 192 rules in production. And we tested combinations, just checking down some of them on three and a half million transactions. And we tested more than 1,000 combinations in just 15 minutes. And we improved detection a lot. And we actually were able to improve detection five times because they also had some white listing <coughs> rules. So it was a very complicated system where some rules will always allow a transaction to go through when they triggered. Um, and in the end, they had 98 rules that were worse than useless. They were just making the system be worse. And we could see 98 rules actually more than average, uh, more than, than half of the number. So more than half of the rules were actively making the system worse. Okay, so just to conclude, typical data science project takes multiple weeks and has all these phases. Given the number of clients that we have and uh, how long, uh, well, how much effort you need to do all of this, we are really trying to bring this down to one day. That's our goal. It's uh, optimizing as much as we can in data science work. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Miguel, thank you for sharing that with us. So, any questions for Miguel before lunch? Small questions and uh, probably more elaborate questions. <laughs> the two small questions. It's one of them is what what is the criteria that you use to stop the the learning process in the. You mean during model selection? When when we have, you have several models, you probably will want to to stop some models to continue because of overfitting or whatever. Okay, so the question is, when do you stop models, when do you stop training more models? Uh, I'm not actually sure if you're asking when do you stop training more models, or when do you stop the current model from... When you stop the current models, some of the current models. Okay, yeah, because um, that's actually a good question, because some models, um, for instance, models that are based on gradient descent, they will just converge and get better and better over time. And the typical solution that problem, figuring out when you should stop. It's you measure your validation error from time to time on those models and there will come a point where you are getting less and less improvement and that's when you stop. That's the typical solution. Uh, what we presented here, like in other types of models, like random forests or gradient boosted trees, and they, are based, they are not based on gradient descent. So the model itself will reach a point where it will just be finished. When you are building a decision tree, there, is, there will come a point where that's it. The tree is built and you can so evaluate it. You, you said like, uh, if, if it doesn't evolve in any iterations, then it stops. Yeah. Okay. So, but, and then the question becomes, how many models do you try? And it's typically driven by a deadline at, at some point. But there is a time that you have and we time bound that process typically. Actually, we typically time bound this full loop. But not the model monitoring part, but at least the feature engineering, feature selection, model selection, you can always go back. So this is actually a loop. And most of the time, you really need to time bomb it. Okay. Uh, the second question is, what are the metrics you use to dif that differentiate the, the, the models, the results from the models? Do you use uh, R-square or, mm. or, okay, so or, or just really concentrate on the error? So the question was which metrics we use. Um, we typically train classification models. So the, the metrics we use are related to classification problems, and it's typically a binary classification problem. Because our data is very unbalanced, so like you might have one fraudulent transaction every 10,000 fraudulent transactions, there are some metrics that are really useless. Like if you try to measure accuracy, a system that is shut off will be right 99.999% of the time because fraud is very rare. So the techniques we use instead are related to measuring 
how frequently you are right versus being wrong with heavily penalizing being wrong. So measuring the detection rate at a given false positive rate is very common. I think that's the most common metric we use. Although we also measure precision, so when we say that something is fraud, which percentage of the time are we correct? That's also something that we typically want to track. But it really depends from client to client as well. Okay. Uh, just a just last question. Do you, do you have more structured models also, or you just use directly like uh, an ANN or RNN? Or, uh, what do you mean by a structured model? For instance, a model that combines an RNN with an ANN. I'm talking uh, about deep learning. Okay, so okay, talking about neural networks. Um, we do, but we don't do model selection on the architecture. Because trying to change the architecture automatically is much harder. Um, it's a much more difficult problem. So we don't we typically don't change the architecture when we are training deep learning models. I mean we don't change it automatically. Data scientists will want to try different architectures, but it's not an automated process yet. So, so it, it's it, it's difficult because you want to automate and uh, that process would take you too much time probably, no? To, to, yeah, because, I mean, to, testing, to study different architectures. Testing different models. hyperparameters is much easier than creating a new network automatically because a network is a much more complicated, it has many more relations, so it's much harder. But we have also tested um, RNNs, and I think I actually have some even slides in this presentation showing that, uh, but uh, I didn't talk about that today, and it's also giving very good results in our use case. Are they giving good results, the RNNs, yeah. compared to the ANNs? Yeah? Okay. Yeah, because time is really important in our, in our use case. Of course.